The temperature is nice and warm in the Boiling Point podcast studio, so come on in, get cozy, and let's enjoy the conversation. We empower leaders through thoughtful discussions to positively impact our world. Our host, Dave Vale, founder and CEO of Vision Coaching, Inc., is highlighting how we can thrive in business communities. Our conversations with leaders, entrepreneurs, and inspirational storytellers are shining a spotlight on empowerment. Joining Dave this week is our special guest host, Emily Roger. Let's join the conversation with Dave and Emily. Well, welcome back to The Bowling Point. I am with my uh, co-host, Emily. Emily, how are you? I am doing well, Dave. How are you? I'm doing, I'm doing, I'm a little bit tense um, because uh, I came a little late to our, um, to get set up and um, and you kindly kind of said, it's okay, you know, and I, I noticed you were early, I was late, and then all these technical issues are on me. And we and our guest who we're going to introduce in a second was very kind and said, you know, uh, we're going to talk to her about that. But I'm starting to calm down now. But I did want to mention something. I saw a cool post you put out on LinkedIn. And I, my, I read it quickly. And it was you looking very fit. And it was a 4.30, something about being up, getting up at 4.30 a.m. Yeah. And, yeah. and I went man, I feel like a slug. Like that's, <laughs> like that, like that is early um, um, and very impressive. So I just, I, and what was the reaction to that? But I also, I, um, I go to bed at like 8.30 though. So it's very relative because at seven o'clock, I do not function anymore. Well, like absolutely. anything after 7 p.m., nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but that's awesome. So you're like hugely disciplined, eh? You, like I know you've, you're, you know, you were um, uh, like a world-class athlete you know, but you, there's something that's still important to you about exercise and, and what it does for you. There is. Yeah. And just setting that tone for the day. I know what I need to do in order to make myself feel good and, um, and to be able to put myself first at the beginning of the day so that I can then show up for others to be here to support you during your technical troubles. <laughs> Through you? Yeah. Well, well, we share that it, not at the same time, but the, the, the importance of, of just like as a mental health strategy in my case, as I've said many, yeah. many times, but, um, but so, so we're going to bring our guests in and, um, and tell, well, maybe before we do, I'm going to ask you, you know, um, we had this, uh, I, I sent the email introduction and we've got some information. What, what do you, what excited you about the guests we're about to, to interview? I, there are so many things that I look forward to unpacking with her. I think really kind of this thing of like breaking away from who we like stereotypically could think entrepreneurs, uh, business owners could, should be. For me, really, it was like kind of, yeah, breaking down a lot of stereotypes that are there. And uh, it, she, even just reading some of her stuff has been very thought-provoking to me and opening my eyes more to, oh, wow, I am actually an entrepreneur. Like before, I could not really say it as confidently as I think that I can right now. Okay. Isn't that interesting? So, and you are, because you're telling me some cool things and hopefully we'll get to learn more about some of the things you're doing, but let's bring in Madeline. Um, welcome. And, and thank you for, um, you know, kindly kind of patiently waiting and also saying, um, you know, you mentioned that we have to have compassion for each other now, especially now. Uh, and I thought that was a that was a perfect thing to tell me as I'm trying to get, <laughs> trying to get this thing going. So um, I would love for you to introduce yourself, and then we're gonna we're gonna dive into some some really cool stuff we've been reading. Amazing. Well, thank you to all of you. It's my absolute pleasure and honor to be here with um, the wonderful community that you're creating with Boiling Point and. Um, yeah, so hello everybody. My name is Madeline Shaw and I'm greeting you this morning from the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil tooth people um, just south of Vancouver this morning and um, it's a beautiful, very crispy, clear, chilly day and uh, I feel great. Um, so about me, I'm a serial social entrepreneur, started my first venture in 1993. Um, making reusable menstrual products, which at the time was outrageous. Like people told me I was off my rocker and today has become a multi, multi approaching billion dollar industry. So I'm really pleased to be sort of one of the original groundbreakers, um, one of the leaders 
years in that what now is you know becoming fairly normative in um, quite an exciting but a bit of a mixed way. Um, I have also founded an event series for tween girls in 2014 that became um, we've produced events nationally for about six years until COVID shut that down. Um, and that was called G Day. The company I founded was called Luna Pads. Today is known as Isle. Um, I also founded a family friendly co working space in 2017 um, that where I'm still working on developing a community where the idea is essentially a new take on work life balance, um, what, what we call integration where it's more about um, instead of separating family life and work life, it's more about integrating them. And most recently, I wrote my first book um, called The Greater Good, Social Entrepreneurship for Everyday People Who Want to Change the World. And that came out in October. So and let's see what else about me. I am a gardener and passionate gardener and some very interested in roller derby for youth in Vancouver as well. Really? Yeah. Is there, is, well, the question is, is there anything you don't do? <laughs> well, I don't, I don't do technology very well, which is why I have this message of compassion about it, because it just, I, if I was really hard, like, anyways, it's one of my um, sort of pet peeve meets Achilles heel type things. And so I always, when I see it going on, I'm just, you know, uh, feel very kind of compassionate for people. You know, we're just doing our best and these are hard times. The world's a bit of a mess right now. And I think that we need to just be a little bit gentler with ourselves. So, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm handing the, 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 the lead over to you now, Emily, because I know you want, you had some, I, I really thought it was interesting you saying, um, you know, in reading Madeline's uh, book um, or advanced copy of the stuff you sent to us, um, you started this, you know, kind of changing the opinion you have of, of, of mm -hmm. what entrepreneurship is. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that, um, you know, how are what really kind of resonated with me, Madeline, so many parts, but about the, um, you know, when you were speaking about your the inner child meditation, that's in your book, and I would love for you to explain more about that. But it was in those moments of doing those exercises that you had in there, that it was like, yeah, this like, um, entrepreneurial part of me it's always been a part of me it's not it's not a new thing um, but even just finding more clarity in that exercise so I would love to kind of start with for you like for the greater good book how long has that been on your heart to write that oh gosh years yeah I would say mm, probably seven or eight years at least yeah and what was your call to action to put that out there for people like myself to be able to read that? Oh, it's well, it's always struck me. So, uh, you know, I started identifying as an entrepreneur in the early 1990s. And um, but I was really coming from a social impact place. And even then, like having come of age in the 1980s, when it was all about like, unfettered capitalism like it was always the school of bigger better faster more um you know the to me my shape my imagination was shaped fortunately by anita roddick the founder of the body shop she was the first person i saw that i could personally relate to and i think that was partly because she's a woman and partly because she was driven by a social impact agenda like so she didn't start the body shop to become you know a multi multi million dollar international company she started as a way to be able to have her husband was traveling a lot for work and she was interested in natural products and so she started this thing in her garage um, basically as a vehicle to express her environmental values and to be able to be a, a mom as much as possible and so that she was really the one who kind of got it going for me and but through my entire career like i have seen for every person, you know, I think in the media, it's all about these tech folks down in Silicon Valley and the big story about disrupting things and raising, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars and whatever. And it's a very hard profile to identify with. You know, most people don't do that. Most companies don't need venture capital and don't raise it. And it, it's this kind of very elite um, perspective that I think a lot of people hold. And so the book is very much about dismantling that and going actually, you know, something as simple and as humble as organizing something in your own community, doing what you can with what you've got where you are, 
um, whether it's for profit or not for profit, like in my opinion, it doesn't matter. It's about initiative. It's about leadership. And, and most of all, it's about being driven by trying to make the world a better place as opposed to, you know, a market gap or whatever. Um, and really democratizing and making the whole notion of entrepreneurship much more inclusive. And so I'm thrilled to hear that, you know, you yourself are feeling that it's like, yeah, I'm an entrepreneur. And, uh, you know, I, I love that because I really feel like the more we can encourage people, what I call everyday people, which is to say folks not in Silicon Valley and not necessarily trying to blow things up with some tech app, you know, whatever Instagram for dogs, I don't know what's next, but, um, really meaningfully working from a place of values, we need to encourage those people um, because collectively that's what it's going to take to make a difference in our times, I believe. Well, and you talk about everyday people doing extraordinary things is one of the headings of of that first chapter. Um, And so, so like, what's the spirit for you of that? Oh my goodness. Well, one of the stories that I share is of Nadia Hamilton. who's a friend of mine. Um, She's based in the sort of, uh, Toronto area and she grew up with her husband or her husband her um, brother being a man with autism and she just ob- observed his daily struggles and so this is coming from a place of deep deep love and compassion and just um, she was studying science at university and kept sort of thinking about what were ways that she could make her brother's life easier and so you know when she was a kid she would make drawings for him that she would tack up on the wall next to his bed Um, to remind him about how to brush his teeth or, you know, what to wear, how to get dressed, this type of thing. And um, so she ended up taking those ideas and digitizing them. And today the company is called Magnus Mode, and it basically promotes accessibility for folks, um, not just on the autism spectrum, but with all kinds of cognitive challenges to navigate the real world, where to go, how to take the bus. And it's an app that you have on your telephone and it's personalized. And, um, and it's also sponsored by corporations wanting to help, you know, how do you navigate a grocery store? How do you go to the bank? These types of things. So she's created a really inter, very innovative uh, marriage between love, technology, and um, leveraging corporate interest and, and kind of resources to integrate this all to make life easier for folks with cognitive challenges. And you know, she never, she didn't study business, you know, she was a science student. And um, so a lot of these stories, when I say everyday people, it's like, I think we can all relate to having some kind of a pain point or, or a crisis or something that we just wish was different. And, you know, in my case, what that looked like was having allergic reactions to disposable pads and tampons in my, you know, early to mid twenties. And it was like, I've got to solve for this because there's nothing else. There's just these disposable drugstore products that are, you know, literally kind of driving me crazy. And so I started just making solutions that I thought would just be for me, you know, and, um, but when I saw how great they were, I decided that I wanted to commercialize them in order to, to share them with other people, but I didn't have a business background. I really needed to change the story I had about myself in order to, to do that. Cause if I just said, ah, I don't, I'm not an entrepreneur. I don't know anything about business. I'm just going to you know, keep this little thing to myself and go about my business. Can you imagine like, you know, today there are companies all over the world making reusable menstrual products. And which is not to say that I was, you know, I'm responsible for that. I'm not, but I was certainly one of the very earliest proponents and had to slog through decades of really getting people to think about it differently and opening themselves up um, to having a very different, uh, much more honest, much more respectful conversation about menstruation. So I'm very proud of that. And so I think everybody's got something inside them, you know, and it's just a lot of the time we say no to that for various reasons. And, um, and so the book is really designed to get people to say yes, and to, to go, let's hold hands, let's do it together. Like it doesn't, you know, need to be some big, huge thing. It doesn't need to be scalable. You know, we're sort of obsessed with that idea as well. And I, and that's another thing I totally dispute, um, and have a very different way of looking at scale. And so, yeah. It, and well, I'm guessing that resonates with you. Like, I and I would, I'd love to explore this with both of you. Is it like I wonder, you know, how you, you know, when you, for you, Emily, when you think about, you know, how how maybe this has kind of opened your eyes to, you know, a part of you that maybe was dormant, or in terms of entre- being an entrepreneur, um, and I'm, I'm putting words in your mouth, maybe, but um, 
but I'm, I'm but part of what I'd like to talk about if you guys are open to it is is there is there a gender thing going on there a little bit you know is, you know and because and, I'm just curious because I I'm hearing this and I'm I'm not relating it from the standpoint of like I just thought oh why don't I just try to do that like I, my problem is I've never been an employee I've tried a couple times just I'm terrible so yeah. I had to it's self-employed but i and having said that i'm totally with you on the scaling thing in terms of like this big push to it and it's like exhausting right but let's go back to that idea of you know everyday people doing extraordinary things so for you emily like what does that resonate or like how does that yeah i think it certainly does i mean you know you know my story my background in in um you know being a adult really before i got involved in sport and then racing at the elite level and everything kind of coming a little bit later and yeah whether that is but i also see and madeline i'd love to get your thoughts on this because i know you had um mentioned this earlier in the emails and this really kind of struck me but like what certain feminine traits that are uh like really there for business leaders that are really strong assets in business leaders mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you for that. And and so, yeah, just to circle back um, to answer Dave's question, like, absolutely, I think there's a gender thing here. Like, I think that what we see in the entrepreneurial space, whose ventures get funded, um, what the criteria are for being perceived as successful, um, all of that, you know, the statistics kind of bear out that, um, you know, women owned and led businesses were still received less than 10% of all venture capital funding. Women of color owned and led businesses receive less than 1%. Um, and the, the sort of perceived uh, metrics of success are about scale. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily about impact or about um, innovation or uh, environmental responsibility or anything like it's just about kind of growth for growth's sake and so i see um i'm just trying to like get past this notion of hustle culture and because i do perceive that as being a very masculine kind of this 24 7 and disruption and uh, move fast and break things and kind of all these silicon valley tropes um that are are super aggressive and super kind of unrealistic like emily you spoke very very powerfully um early in the call about your personal circadian rhythm, which is that you like to go to bed by 8 p.m. and get up at four and do your thing. And that's not even, I don't even necessarily perceive that as discipline because I live in the world that you do too. I get up, I go to bed super early, I get up super early. That's just what I like. It's just what feels good to me and natural. And, and this idea that we've got to be on 24 7 365, that we've got to be hustling and pushing and making things happen and and whatever like i i really think that we're in a time where we we don't need any more disruption we don't need to break things we don't even need to necessarily move quickly we just need to move with clarity and intention and led by our values and and to this idea of sort of i guess feminine if you will and i am very wary of sort of binary notions around gender and so when i say feminine i mean that not in the sense of all women do this um, or all female identified people do this, but um, the value of collaboration over competition, I think is something that we're gonna start seeing a lot more like, and just the primacy, the necessity of taking care, taking care of the planet, taking care of people. Like we are moving from um, a notion of capitalism and business for, that has been traditionally very extractive. And I think that we are seeing a shift into something that is relational. And partly it's driven by absolute, just pure necessity. Like, come on, like how much clearer, I'm sitting here in BC where we've just seen massive flooding, massive fires, like this place has just been, a cauldron of climate change in the past year and um we need to prioritize different things in in business and in our lives and to me the idea of just sort of killing it and you know taking this zero-sum game where where it is to be won or lost like that's not what's happening anymore it's it's saving what we can and in order to do that we're going to need to be collaborative and not not competitive or less competitive is uh, sort of my view on it right now. Uh, I couldn't. Well, I mean, the, the collaboration is hard, by the way, right? I mean, it requires um, trust and cooperation. 
Yeah, it's a whole, it's a huge mindset shift. Like, I mean, we have been educated in, and even myself, like I didn't go to business school. I had to, you know, my entire business education has been experiential and having a really smart business partner. Um, but that's kind of drilled into you. Like you're competing, you're competing. You've got to, you know, anything who's doing anything like what you're doing, then you've got to, you know, get the better of that person or that company. And it's just so destructive and unnecessary in many cases. Like I, I actually do a mini case study of this on in the case of the, the natural menstrual product kind of space. It's like, this is a theoretically inexhaustible market. Like you've got hundreds of millions of new customers every day, you know, um, that are going to be menstruating for, you know, 30 years, like, come on, like whether they want to or not for the most part, like, and, and yet there's still a lot of the new businesses in the space are sort of having this push pull more kind of, um, scale, 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 um, kind of ethos because they're, that's just how they've been socialized. And I feel like there's still an opportunity for this to be kind of a microcosm of showing people people that there can be more inclusive ways to do business. But you're right, Dave, we need to unlearn a mindset that is just this default. You know, we have to compete. And interestingly, so what I'm looking into right now, and you asked about my interests earlier in the call, um, I've been reading the work of Dr. Suzanne Samard, who's a forest ecologist at the University of British Columbia, and has written a book called Finding the Mother Tree. And she's basically upended all of the things thinking about how forests grow. So her research has demonstrated that, you know, the previous wisdom that trees and plants competed with one another, and that's how they grew. You know, it's like, I need more light, I need more nutrients, I need more water, whatever. That's not how they grow. They grow through interconnected root systems where they share nutrients and they share water and they even share information with each other. And that's how a forest grows. And so if we take that as our metaphor, this very basic natural metaphor that we can adopt as human beings, because we all need to survive, right? We all need to work to save this planet. So anyways, that, those are the types of things that inspire me and that I think um, are possible, but we do need to learn how to think differently. You know what, you know what's, and I'm gonna get Emily's thought on this, but because you know, you, we're, we're both in the coaching industry, like business coaching, yeah. business coaching leadership coaching. And, and I would describe um, to anyone that is interested and would ask me, you know, about our business model, meaning vision coaching, my companies, and it's, it was set up to be collaborative uh, from the, you know, in, at least that's, in, you know, my, my definition of it. Um, and, and, and so you're collaborating with a bunch of coaches that in a sense, you know, I've had people come that maybe come from more of that competitive side and they say, geez, your business model, you know, um, because people will have their own shingle and then they'll subcontract with, with vision coaching and we have agreements on, you know, what that looks like. Um, but I don't want to limit what someone can do on their own because there's so much business out there, you know, um, that, that like, why would, why would I, you know, and, and what's interesting is, is um, it just seems so easy to do. And maybe it's, maybe it's the mindset that come, you know, people that with the mindset that come to, to this, you know, coaching and the idea of people are capable and whole and, and you just, you want, you're there to facilitate, you know, their, their, you know, their brilliance and you're not there to tell them because how would I possibly know what's good for Emily or for you, Madeline, or for Jean-Viev or whatever, or, you know, and, and vice versa. But do you, do you agree with that, Emily? Do you, like from what, you know, as you're entering the market, you know, in the last couple of years, are you, do you see that collaborative kind of uh, mindset? Like, I do a lot more than I have seen it in many other professions. And I think for me, um, how it is so easy to be that way uh, as a coach, which with other coaches, with other colleagues is because like you said, with the clients, like we're holding them fully capable, like that in itself is a partnership and that shows the power of partnership. So, and to not limit ourselves to it just there, because we're all clients, we're all coaches. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, being able to grow and to learn from one another and not having to, you know, cut down the tallest poppy in the fields in order to be able to grow. No, we can all grow and we can grow and flourish so much stronger and better when we support one another in that. And, and 
Dave, I've learned a lot of that from you, from seeing you of, of the way that you act, of, of how you promote my business and coaching, you promote others. And it is like such a phenomenal example for not just coaches, but leaders, anyone out there in the world. Yeah, well, ironically, and Madeline will know this, but when you, when you start collaborating and start sharing the success of others, it, 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 you know, and your intention maybe is to shine the light on someone else, but it comes back to you tenfold, I found. <laughs> you know, does that make sense, Madeline? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think it, um, this notion of kind of circularity that you just pointed to is something that I, I talk about in the book as well. Like we've, we're coming out of sort of a linear mindset um, and entering, yeah, a period, I think, of, of circularity where things, even the notions of like that I, in the past it's been, my expense or success comes at the expense of someone else. It's you or me who's going to get it, right? It's me or Emily. Mm -hmm. It's not me and Emily or me and you or you and Emily. It's been this either or kind of binary um, perspective. And I think that's changing. It's changing in so many other ways. Like it's changing around gender. It's changing around, you know, just, well, that's the biggest one that I would point to actually, that is, is seismic. Right. And so I think that we're going to see that with a lot of things, the for-profit nonprofit is another not helpful distinction in my opinion. Like, um, I think that there should be just way greater um, innovation and latitude in terms of the types of legal entities that and and all of the judgments that go, go along with them and, and assumptions like basically, you know, and a project and initiative a venture needs to have all the same basic components, whether you are for or nonprofit, like it's kind of an academic distinction, you know, and um, and yet it's still fairly prevalent and but with things like b corps and triple c3s here in bc and um co-ops and anyways i talk about all of that in the book and just you know it's not just a different way kind of practice of um leadership or a set of objectives that you have that are informed by your values it, it can also go down right down to the type of legal structures that we are creating um to support these entities and these projects and these initiatives yeah. So practical. Um, so one, if, if I may, I'd, like, I'd love to jump into one of my favorite topics. I named the company Vision Coaching for a reason, yeah. belief and vision, and how it's impacted my life when I, um, and you, you have a chapter on exploring vision. Yeah. What, what's your perspective? Oh, I love it. Um, well, that actually leads back to Emily's point earlier about this inner child sort of um, perspective. So I think sometimes there's a, I mean, vision can be so many, it can come from so many different places. Yes, it can be the blinding bolt from the blue where you just or you wake up in the middle of the night and go, oh, I've got it, you know, like, absolutely, that happens. Um, but it also shows up in over over years, you know, it, I think of it as a trail of cosmic breadcrumbs in that in that you're kind of getting little hints here and there or exposure to different ideas or conversations that you have or um, pain points or I don't know anyways tons of stuff um, but one of the more profound tools for people who are like ah, I just you know I'm feeling restless or I'm I'm not sure I want to do something but I'm not sure what it is I I do suggest that they go back and do kind of a regressive meditation where they revisit their inner child and so uh and for people i don't know anyways what does it for me about that is i think that there is some kind of an inherent purpose or gift in in everyone and yet we're sort of raised in this as i said linear world where you know we're mandated to conform to a certain set of social expectations so maybe you know um your parents you wanted to be an artist but your parents said oh well, you'll never make money doing that or you know you wanted to be, i don't know there was some kind of social messaging that told you that what your dream was or your vision was as a youth was somehow inappropriate or impractical um and so it kind of got shelved or maybe even buried, like maybe you don't even remember what that was, uh, you know, or maybe you're doing it, I don't know. But for me, I wasn't like, um, a lot of the things that I wanted when I was a kid, um, like I knew I was a leader as a child, I knew that. And I just knew I was different, like yourself, I knew that I wasn't gonna have some, you know, mainstream form of socially acceptable employment that, you know, my parents would say, oh, you know, she's a this and so proud. Um, 
but there was always a kind of a fascination with the idea for me of of being a woman and as it was exemplified by menstruation and i know not all women menstruate and not all people who menstruate are women um but that was what was true for me as a cisgender woman um and girl at that time and that that was just always going to be a dream and I, there's something powerful in it. There's something really, really cool that if you just take some time and close your eyes and breathe deeply and just call that person, you know, imagine yourself age 10, you know, like kind of that threshold between childhood and adolescence and find that person, ask them what they were interested in, just observe them um, and see what comes to you. And often what you, there may be a memory associated that of something that you love to do or were fascinated by and, is kind of the stone that has been left unturned in your life. Um, I don't know. Have you seen that in your work? Because you're both coaches, so you must kind of have this conversation. You know, you named your company for it. But to me, that's that's the most powerful way of accessing that that just inner vision, inner drive. Um, what we're what we're put here to do. What do you think, Emily? Yeah, well, and what came up for me, Madeline, when I was doing the exercise that you had spoke about in the book, it was this like aha moment of, wow, my vision is so aligned with that childhood Emily of, of coaching of being a leader of um, doing like I host fly fishing trips and love outdoor adventure. And when I look back, even if I look at Emily as a five year old. It was the Emily who loved more than anything to sneak into her mom's room and try on her grandmother's just like timeless classic jewelry and get dressed up and then take it off and go straight down to the brook and go fishing and just be outside. And another memory that came to me was my dad had this hobby farm and we would all get on the lawn mower and there was a little trailer hooked up to it. My sisters, my cousins, we'd all sit in it. And my older sister would give us a tour of the hobby farm. And I remember just thinking, oh, I cannot wait until I'm older and I can be the one giving the tour. I can be the one leading and bringing people out into this, like what I thought was this like wilderness zoo that we lived in. And so much of what I do today in many levels is that. I get dressed up for, for work every day. I put on my jewelry and then I go on a fish. I spend the weekends like bringing people out or going out on my own. And it's like, wow, it was just, it's, it's Emily. <laughs> and you found, you, said, you know, it sounds like you, you found that. And then in retrospect, kind of realized maybe where that came from, you know, given what you've, you know, that whole reading that chapter, maybe in particular. Yeah. Yeah. And so Dave, what comes up for you? If you kind of think that, if you reflect back childhood and where you are now. Yeah. Well, do you, you know, I, I have a, an early memory. Uh, well, and when I say early, like I like actually, uh, Madeline, how you said, you know, you know, kind of almost, I heard you like preteen, you know, that, that, mm -hmm. that part of you. So I was in junior high. So you're maybe grade seven and we had this classroom and, and I, I, I suffered through school. Like I did school, but I just, the constraints of sitting in a desk Sit, and I just, it was like painful. And I learned how to look and take notes, but have my brain go somewhere completely off. Like I was, I was in, you know, doing all these cool things. And for whatever reason, I saw this, um, this, this truck, like maybe it was, I don't know if it was FedEx or whatever it was, drive up and a guy run in and drop, and, and drop a package off and then go back. And just, it represented to me freedom compared to where I was sitting. And I, I remember thinking, I, I can't, do this like I can't continue to do like I will do this till grade 12 and you know and even when I went went to university I kind of had my own way of of of, of accessing information I just but it, I just knew it just wasn't working for me so I so so it's not so much about coaching but it's more about that memory of just that represented and I feel you know at this stage feel relatively free you know in terms of and I work in a way that really doesn't work for probably a lot of people but works really nicely for me um, so, so, so that, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's, that's, that's kind of a mem early memory that when you say this and, and, and I think entrepreneurship kind of speaks to that because, you know, in early days, um, I, I you know, never really, I, I have a bricks and mortar office a couple of times, but it was always about places I could work and, and go and work and meet clients, but I needed to be flexible and I needed to want to work from anywhere. And, and the whole idea of working remotely was what drew, drew me to the coaching industry actually, as much as the work we do. 
um, but it was just not being not just getting rid of those constraints. So um, and and I feel like in the coaching work we do, um, you're really fortunate to meet people who you know in confidentially will start sharing like you know what I, I know I've been practicing law for 20 years or I've been a physician or whatever, but you know I, I, there's got to be something different. And it's neat to hear people start to to allow themselves to think of that. And and then often they'll say. You know, I can't believe I'm in my 50s thinking this or 40s. And, you know, my response would be, well, you know, good thing you're not in your 60s thinking this, right? Like, well, so what is now? Free came to you now. Like, that's great. So what are you going to do with it? Totally. Yes. And I, this is, again, raises such an important point around just the, the inherently kind of liberating nature of entrepreneurship. Like, you know, it, we don't need to fit into a certain kind of box we don't need to you know conform to really any set of expectations and there's an incredible opportunity for creativity and the expression of personal values and there's something kind of transgressive about it like there really is like you are not playing by the rules like you are setting you're just creating your own adventure really I just, like I, I wonder if there's some value in not being shaped by business school in other words, you know, not having because that the, the the idea of this is how you run a business, and not, and not that there's anything wrong with people that that fall into you know like but the, like uh, like the most um, I don't know, frustrating is maybe the word I'd use, but emails I'll get when someone who doesn't know me will tell me they can they know how to 10x my company, and it's like but do, do you know how do you know I even want to 10x my company if you know I, and maybe that's not a motivation for me, and and it's not to say I don't believe that could happen, but but why don't you ask like what's important for you in your business and and you know and, and scale i at one point i remember i believed like this is the path and because I, I just i was hearing it all around me and and it almost took me down to be honest with you because it was trying to, you know so hard and i forgot i got i got away from the vision i got away from actually what was real and then when i got back to it ironically the business is doing better than ever so it's just uh i don't know i i i, I I think maybe there's some value in that, but um, I am watching the time, believe it or not, the guy who's terrible at time and stuff. So um, how do people learn more about you, Madeline? Where can they get information on the book? Where can they, you know, learn about all these cool things you're doing? Um, like what's that, what's the, maybe if they wanted to reach out to you or get you on another podcast or talk to you, what would, how would they do that? Yeah, um, well, I'm pretty available. So um, probably, and here is the book. Um, the website for the book is greatergood.work and it's greatergoodbook on Instagram. Um, I have a website at madelineshaw.ca and I'm probably the easiest way to reach me is on LinkedIn. I'm frankly, I'm not super active in social media. It's It's one of my... I don't know. It's it's not my happy place, I would say. And um, and so, or someone can just email me m at greatergood.work. You don't even need to worry about how to spell Madeline because that can be a challenge. I appreciate. And um, I just love to hear from people because I'm, you know, I've I've got a whole bunch of social entrepreneurs who are featured on my website as well. And so, folks, you know, who are already, you know, got some kind of an initiative going, I would love to hear from you and feature you on the website. Um, just really trying to show people that it's like, you don't need to be, I don't know, somebody down in Silicon Valley with an app and the big VC scene. Like you, you can be someone in your community doing a venture that matters to you, that you think is interesting, um, that is reaching people, that it, it's not, you're not trying to 10 exit as your uh, email buddy. You're not trying to do any of those things. You're just trying to make the world a better place in your own way and really, you know, if coming from a place that is driven by your values, not just about the, you know, market opportunity. So um, of any age and of any scale, and, of, you know, this is another thing that we, we see, I believe, you know, I'm seeing lots of people in their 60s start really amazing ventures, you know, yeah. people who have basically spent their careers kind of doing the right thing and but are have not been actually satisfied. Um, on a personal level through that and who are going to, you know, social entrepreneurship as a way of expressing that as their kind of last chapter of their career, which is really cool. So I would love to hear from people and um, let's have this as a conversation. And this has been an incredibly rich conversation with both of you and really grateful to have been a guest today. I, well, I, we really appreciate you taking the time and, you know, kind of sharing your, your experiences and I'll, I'll let, I'll let uh, Emily kind of 
get the, to do the tail end here and then we're going to jean have to remind people of all those important things about sharing mm -hmm. and all the stuff and she can also say something about the the ring that's in my in my glasses that <laughs> we had to fix but we didn't or i could i just not we i didn't i couldn't fix it um but thanks madeline and and i, and I would you know if there's ever a chance to make sense i'd love to talk about the idea of you know having an integrated life versus a balanced life. I just couldn't agree with that uh, more. And uh, I think there's a lot, um, there's a, that's a neat conversation as well. So I'll just put that little plug in. So Emily, you, I'm gonna, we'll, we'll leave it to you to, 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 to end this and then we'll get John Vieb to, to do her brilliant, uh, telling people where to find us and all that good stuff. Yeah, Madeline, this was a pleasure. And I will say that what I appreciated most about your book was that it was so easy to read. It was not full of jargon. I could like fully grasp and understand and kind of feel and live what it was that you were speaking about. And um, yeah, I really appreciated that. And one of my biggest takeaways that I am taking from this conversation with you and um, from your book is this concept of do what you can with what you've got, like you said, to make the world a better place right where we are, because we all have the ability to, um, to create change, to create positive social impact, and to inspire others to do the same. And you have done that for me. So thank you. That means the world to me to hear that. Awesome. All right, John Viev, you're on mute. Just so you okay. Know. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Now, um, if uh, if you want to check out more videos of uh, seeing if Dave has a special glean in his eye during that episode, uh, you can head over to our website, boilingpointpodcast.com, uh, where you can find all of our different conversations. You can also connect with us on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Uh, of course, you can listen on any of your favorite podcast platforms. You can subscribe and like there as well. Uh, and if you like the video versions, because who wouldn't want to see Dave in all his glory with the glimmer in his eyes from his ring light, you can head to YouTube and Facebook and they are released there. Or, I or, said the ring light should go behind his head. Uh, <laughs> or, and, or Madeline's, uh, she, like she changed her, her glassware that we called it. Um, it was a great spec. So. Thanks, people. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Boiling Point Podcast. Remember to subscribe and rate our podcast on your favorite listening platform. To find out more, head to our website at boilingpointpodcast.com. You can connect with us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. To find out more about Dave Vale's work, head over to visioncoachinginc.com. Thanks for listening, and make sure to check out our next conversation.